question was, you picked a company, you is it a publicly traded company? Okay. If it's a private business, do not pick a private business unless you know people in the private business. They don't have to give you financials. Right? So what private company do you pick and why do you pick it? A private company with, that people trade the private company? If you can't find the information, just let it go, right? I mean, in a sense, you either pick a private company, we have access to the information, or you don't. Yeah. Yeah. You're a share, oh, if you're a shareholder in a company and you cannot find the information, this is usually a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> that they're holding things back from you that they shouldn't. I would threaten to sell my shares, they might not care and say go away, but um, it's not a good practice in general to invest in companies that they hold back financials. So it, it's a very good company to invest in because it gives you around like... Because they don't tell you anything, so you can make up whatever you want, so... They do, but you have to be there. Okay. To emails, okay. So uh, uh, I'll let you deal with that and decide uh, wh when you want to abandon ship, right? Um, so pick a company. So today we're going to talk about risk-free rates and risk premiums, right? So as I said, with each of these classes, I'm going to ask you questions before I even cover them because I want you to work through an answer based on common sense. And I think most of the time you're going to get the answer correct. So here's my start of the class test for today. Incidentally, these are slides you won't see in your packet because they're the slides that you can download on the webcast page if you want to see them, but you really don't even need to download them because you'll see them and you can just let them go. So here's my first question. You've been asked to estimate the risk-free rate. I'm not even asking you to get ambitious, do cash flows, growth rate. Let's leave that to the, for, for the future. A risk-free rate for a Swiss multinational. If you want this to be less abstract, let's give the Swiss multinational, call it Nestle if you want. Okay? This Swiss multinational gets 10% of its revenues in Switzerland, in Swiss francs obviously, 30% of its revenues in the EU, in euros, 40% of its revenues in the US, in dollars, and 20% of its revenues in India, in rupees. So it's a multinational, like any multinational, it gets its cash flows in different currencies. Okay. The risk-free rates are 0.5% in Swiss francs, 1% in euros, 2.5% in dollars, 6% in rupees. Okay, remember your mission is singular, right? You've got to come up with a risk-free rate. Which of the following would you pick? You could take a simple average of those rates. How many would pick the simple average? Nobody is saying simple average, it's so unsophisticated, that can't be the answer. Okay, that's all there. How about a weighted average? Yeah, a minute I threw and waited. I knew you guys were going to put up your hand. Waited, this is... Uh, hold on to that thought, weighted average. How about the Swiss franc rate because it's a Swiss, Swiss company? Okay, so based on incorporation, you're picking Swiss. How many pick the lowest of the rates because it's risk-free? I'll go with the lowest. How many pick the lowest? How many pick the highest just to be conservative? Don't worry, keep your hand up. You're the only person. Do you know the right answer is? None of the above. Why none of the above? What's the answer? It depends on the currency you're doing the analysis in. Can I value Nestle in Swiss francs? Yes. And if I value it in Swiss francs, the risk-free rate will be a Swiss franc risk-free rate. Can I value it in US dollars? Yes. In which case, the risk-free rate will be a US dollar risk-free rate. Can I value in British pounds? Absolutely. In which case, the risk-free rate will be a British pound risk-free rate. You say, what about these averages, the weighted averages? I'll give you an absurd analogy, and you're going to see why I give it. What if I told you that the temperature, the average temperature today between Frankfurt and New York, I'm trying to think of what the numbers would look like, is 22 and a half degrees. 22.5 degrees. The way I got it is I took the temperature in New York, let's say it's 40 degrees, and I took the temperature in Frankfurt, it's 5 degrees, I took the two numbers, added them up and divided by 2. What might I have forgotten to check? One is in Fahrenheit, the other is in Celsius. You take the average of a Fahrenheit and a Celsius, you get absolute junk. You can never, ever, ever average risk-free rates. 
because then you're taking a measurement mechanism. It's like taking half, half of your the cl class here and taking your weight in pounds, the other half in kilograms, adding them all up and coming up with an average. I could take a weighted average, I could take a super weighted average, it's still a screwed up number. There are these notions on risk-free rates that I don't even understand where they come from. I've heard people ask me, what's a global risk-free rate? I said, what? There's no such thing. Risk-free rates go with currencies. They don't go with geography. So if you ask me, what's the risk-free rate for Greece? I don't know. I can tell you what the risk-free rate in euros is. Not all countries have their own currencies. So we're going to come back and talk about this because you're saying, but then wouldn't I get a different value when I value Nestle in Indian rupees as opposed to Swiss francs? And the reason is very simple, right? The discount rate in rupees is going to be so much higher than the discount rate in Swiss francs. You think there must be an effect. I'm going to say something right now and I'll come back and explain in a little while why it's true. If you value a company in a currency, if you do it right, you should have a value that's currency invariant. You have to meet some conditions to get that. They get violated in practice all the time. But we're going to talk about why currencies really shouldn't matter. A company that's undervalued to be undervalued no matter what currency view you bring to the table. Second. Today we're going to talk about equity risk premiums. So we're going to talk about the standard way of estimating equity risk premiums. For those of you in my corporate finance class, you've seen you know, equity risk premiums, but today we'll revisit that discussion. But when a an equity risk premium, very simply, when you talk about a historical equity risk premium, here's what you do. You look at what stocks did over the last five years to 10 years, pick a period, 20 years on average. You look at what treasury bills or bonds did on average and take the difference between those two numbers and say, that's what I earned on stocks versus something risk-free over the last 20 years. Then you make a leap of faith. What's a leap of faith? If you say, that's what I made in the last 20 years, that's what I can expect to make in the future. So you ready? You have to value a company. You need an equity risk premium. You decide to use a historical equity risk premium because that's what you've been taught. That's the way I was taught to estimate equity risk premiums. I'm going to give you some choices you have to make. First, in computing that historical risk premium, should you go with just the most current data? After all, you want numbers that reflect today, so why not go with just one year? What's wrong with doing that? I mean, I already told you it's the wrong answer, so you know, that was the right answer, now he's told me it's wrong. What's, what's, what's the problem? If I did that today, what's that number going to look like? What was last year like for stocks? Do you, do you know? It was a really good year. Do you know what the return on the S&P 500 was last year? 31% if you include dividends. Bonds had a good year too. Why? Because interest rates dropped during the course of the year. The return on bonds though was about 9%. Let me pause right there. If I take the difference between 31 and 9%, I have a 22% equity risk premium. If you say that's what you're going to earn as an equity risk premium from this day on, nothing you value is going to look cheap to you. Because why? You're demanding this huge return you're never going to make. And if I had done this last year, when stocks actually had a negative return and bonds had a positive return, my equity risk premium, I'll be going between 22% and minus 5%. One year is definitely not going to do it. How about five years? Chronologically, that sounds like a lot of time, right? Think of how much your life has changed over the last five years. Is it five years long time? But we're not talking about your life. We're talking about stocks. Stocks are incredibly noisy. And one of the things I'm going to show you as you look at historical risk premiums is the standard error in those numbers. And remember your statistics, right? If you have five years of data, the standard error is going to be immense. So five years of data, you're going to get almost entirely noise. In fact, that should tell you also that D and E are irrelevant because I've seen people trying to be consistent. I use five years for my beta. I'm going to use five years. Not, one has nothing to do with the other. Or if your T-bond rate is 10-year 10, 10 T-bond, you've got to go back 10 years. Now, again, nothing to do with the other. So you know what the right answer is? I've kind of ruled out the others. It's got to be to go back as far as you can. And that should freak you out. Because in the US, I actually have data going back to 1928. Robert Schiller has data going back to 1871. This is good, right? Lots of data. But the US equity market in 1871 was an emerging market. 
You were coming out of the civil war. The US economy was just starting to grow into the global economy. Very, so that's a trade-off, right? You can go back a long time, but you're getting a market that doesn't resemble the least bit the market you're in today. And in fact, here's the final problem with historical risk premiums. At the start of 2008, the equity risk premium in the US, the historical premium, was about 5%. 2008 was a terrible year for stocks. It was down, and the stocks were down 30%. Bonds were up 7% or 8%. If I bring just one additional year into my data, what is going to happen to my risk premium? That ba so basically, I've taken a data base that goes back to 1928. I've now added just one extra year, but that one year is a terrible year for stocks. What should, what's going to happen mathematically to your risk premium? Is it going to go up or go down? It's going to go down because I've added a really bad year for stocks, put in a really good year for bonds. You think, so what? When you're in the midst of a crisis, we, tell, we said the risk premium, the equity risk premium is the price of risk in the equity market, right? It reflects your fears and your hopes. In a crisis, which one dominates, fear or hope? It's fear, you're scared, and when you're scared, what should happen to the risk premium? It should go up, and here I'm saying, oh, you know what, last year was a terrible year, in the middle of a crisis, I think you should bring your equity risk premium down, because that's what I'm saying with the historical premium. I'm laying the basis for abandoning historical risk premiums. They're backward looking, they reflect a market that doesn't exist today, and worse still, they move in the wrong direction, given what I would expect them, given intuition. Now obviously I have to give you an alternative, and I'm gonna lay the foundations for that as well, and I need somebody to be my guinea pig. So, you want me to be my guinea pig? Okay, you're always in the front, so you'll be my guinea pig. So let's assume I come to you with an investment. Okay? A dollar, in cash flows guaranteed forever, every year. How much should you pay for that, for that investment today? Depends on what I could make. Just give me a number. So basically, you know, so you, you, you have a sense of what you can make. It's a US dollar investment, dollar in cash flows. You can give me probably a rough answer, so. so is it a risk-free country? It's guaranteed, it's risk-free. What's, like. what's the risk-free rate in US dollars right now? Let's round it up, 2%. Let's say the risk-free rate is 2%. So you would pay how much? This is the easiest of all present value problems to do, right? A dollar perpetuity, 0.22, it's going to be $50. Why? Because if you pay $50 and you get a dollar every year, you're making roughly 2% the risk-free rate. That took a little coaxing, but we got to $50. Now I'm going to change the investment a little bit. You're still going to get a dollar in cash flows every year, but that dollar is now uncertain. It comes from equity investment, so it no, it could be higher, it could be lower. You have an expected cash flow of a dollar, not a guaranteed cash flow. So let me ask you the easy question first. You were willing to pay $50 for a guaranteed cash flow. Would you pay less or more for? Less. You'd pay less. So give me a number. Ten. $10. When he says $10, what return does he say he needs to make? So if this cash flow is as risky as a typical stock, 1 over 10 is 10%. You've just given me your risk premium, right? Because when you told me how much you would pay for that dollar, whether you like to or not, implicit in what you're willing to pay is an expected return. And if I subtract out the risk-free rate, I have your risk premium. Do you see where I'm going to go with this? If I want to compute an equity risk premium for stocks, it's not my risk premium, collectively, what investors are demanding. Why would I go around asking them, what do you want to make? What do you think you can make? Because I'm going to get absolute garbage because people give you hopes, not expectations. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look at what they pay for stocks. Just like he told me $10, I'm going to look at what you pay for the S&P 500. It's a little messier because you don't get a dollar every year. You get a collective cash flow. That cash flow is going to include dividends and buybacks. I have to estimate what. But once I'm done, I'm going to have a problem just like the one I had where I know what you paid for the S&P 500. I have expectations of cash flows. I can back out from that what the expected return is. And guess what? From that, I can get a risk premium. It's an implied equity risk premium. It's forward-looking because it's based on what you paid today and expected cash flows. It's dynamic. Do you see why? I mean, the last few weeks, you see the coronavirus come and go as a, as a factor in markets. Days, the market is down 500%. Why? The coronavirus. It's up 400%. Why? The coronavirus recedes. It's amazing how in markets, a virus comes and goes and rises and falls. But it's clearly a factor in markets, right? 
So if I take a market and a crisis hits, I can compute the equity risk, and guess what's going to happen? A crisis hits, the stocks drop, my risk premium rises. That actually makes sense to me, that you're in a crisis, you demand a larger risk premium. So we have a lot to do, so let's get started first on risk free rates. So let me turn back to the lecture notes. So I, I left you with this problem, right? This we kind of solved. If you want a risk free rate for a valuation where your cash flows last forever, and the only number you needed was a risk free rate. And you were a purist. I said, go with the longest term, the 30 year bond. But then I said, I explained why I don't use the 30 year bond rate. It's much more likely traded less liquid than the 10 year bond rate. And it makes my life more difficult for the rest of my inputs. So that was the first test. You ready for the second test? Let's suppose, how many of you are planning to value companies in the, in the Eurozone? Anybody? Uh, that few? I guess the Eurozone has fallen out of favor, right? But if you want to value a company in the Eurozone and you decide to do your valuation in Euros, I'll always preface that. You choose your currency. You don't have to value Nestle in Euros or you know, Siemens in Euros. You chose to value in Euros. You need a Euro risk free rate. And with the US dollar rate, that was easy, right? I went and found a government bond in dollars. I got down on my knees and said, please, God, let there be no default risk in the US Treasury. Because remember, that's a belief. That's not a guarantee. Okay? And I use the government bond rate as my risk free rate. With the euro, though, you have a little bit of an issue, which is you have too many bonds out there. You have a dozen different governments issuing 10-year bonds all in euros. This is not 1997. The French government bond was in France. These are all in euros, and the rates are all different. So let's make this specific. Somebody who picked, uh, put up their hand for a euro is on, you know, tell me the company you were choosing. Somebody back there had a euro. Airbus. Airbus. Which kind of, so basically French company, right? Because it's this UK, French, whatever mix. French company. So you have to do, your, so you cho let's say you choose to do your valuation in euros. Which of these rates would you use as your risk free rate? Not Greece. Okay, that we took off the peg. Would you use the French government bond rate? After all, it's a French company. And this is what a lot of European analysts do. The Spanish analyst picks a Spanish 10-year government bond rate. First, these are all in euros, right? So what's the only reason they're different? Because the market perceives more default risk in some countries than others, right? So if you use the Spanish government bond rate or the Greek government bond rate, as your risk-free rate, already you have a problem. How can it be risk-free if it has its default risk embedded in it? I've kind of given away the answer. So what would you use as your risk-free rate here? France plus a, a, a premium, right? France. Let me, let, let's take that. The French bond, we said, has a spread in it. So do you want to go plus or minus? I'll give you a chance to change your answer. Minus, OK. But you don't even have to do that, because when you minus that premium, guess where you're going to end up? You're going to end up at the German bond rate, because it's the lowest of the rates. Because if you think about it, the rate, it's not, I mean, and, and don't take, even if, if you feel you don't want to use any German inputs, in, don't take this as a geographical issue. I'm picking the German bond rate, not because I value the German bond more, but because it is the lowest rate. 10 years from now, the Portuguese 10-year bond rate was the lowest. I'd use the Portuguese 10-year bond rate. Right? So I'm using the German euro bond rate. Is, is that Siri? Siri knows nothing. This is why, this is why I have Alexa in my San Diego house and I have Google in my New York house. Siri's out of the house. She knows nothing. You know? Alexa though would have spouted off something smart ass about the whole thing, you know? So the German euro bond rate. Which is right now? Minus 0.28 percent. That's a little troubling, right? A risk-free rate that's negative. I'll come back with a follow-up test on what do you do if your risk-free rate turns negative. But with the euro, I'm picking the lowest rate because I want something closer to default free. In fact, there are some people. In fact, one reason people worry about the German, the French, and all of these bonds is when they, when you decide to go to a common currency, one of the powers you gave up as a country was the power to print money. 
So there's an argument that even the German euro bond has this residue of default risk that maybe you should use a European Central Bank bond, which is like 0.28% as well, but in, in a sense. But I'm looking for something risk-free. So everybody clear on that? So if you're doing evaluation in euros, no? let's move forward. Let's assume you will now want, uh, yes, go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that because that's a good question, which is if you look at much of the Middle East, the Saudi, the United Arab Emirates, their currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar. And in much of that you know, Middle East, you know what people use as a risk free rate when valuing companies. They use the U.S. T-bond rate and they hope and pray the peg doesn't break. Because I remember being in Argentina in 1998. You know, the Argentine peso was pegged to the U.S. dollar. That peg didn't age very well, right? <laughs> right now, Ecuador is pegged to the US dollar. In fact, somebody who's doing an Ecuadorian company said, no, what should I use as a risk free rate? And I said, use the T-bond rate, but check. And I'll come back and talk about what you might want to check. But I'll come back to that, because there is, I think, a more, the easy answer is use the, T the US dollar risk free rate, but we have to come back and check to see whether the peg will hold. And I'll give you a simple test. Let's move on to the Indian rupee. I want to risk free rate in Indian rupees. I want to start with the Indian government bond rate. There is a 10-year government bond. I don't know how liquid it is. And this is one of the problems. When you go to government bonds in many countries, the liquidity becomes an issue. Indian government bond actually is more liquid than some other 10-year government bonds. And the rate on the 10-year Indian government bond was about 6.56%. So this would be easy if I just could use that as my risk free rate. And all over India, that's what analysts use as a risk free rate, the government bond rate. And I'll give you, I'll play devil's advocate and explain how they justify it. They say, a government should never default on a local currency bond. What's the rationale for that? Why would a government never default? Because you can print more money. And for the longest time, that's the rationale that's been used for using the government bond rate as a risk-free rate, is why would a government ever default if it's a local currency bond? And the answer is, I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> Half of all sovereign defaults in the last 30 years have been local currency defaults, not foreign currency defaults. And there's actually a rational explanation for it. You're a government, you borrow too much money. You can always print, run the printing presses faster and pay off the debt, right? You haven't defaulted, but what's the consequence of, printing, of running your printing presses faster? You've debased your currency. Or you can default. So really the choice is between a rock and a hard place. Would you rather default or would you rather debase your currency? And Latin America has taught us some lessons. Why? Because Latin America is the epicenter of sovereign default. They mastered this. They've, you know, to the nth degree. They've done it so many times that it's become almost an art form. And to give you a contrast between how, how easy or difficult it is to come back from the two, I've been going to Brazil since 1997. The first time I went to Brazil to do evaluation seminar was 97. I've pretty much been going every year since. 97 in Brazil was five years after hyperinflation. 5,500, 6,000% 6, inflation. It had come down, but by 97, people were still scarred. No Brazilian entity was able to issue long-term bonds in reais. Not the government, not companies. Why? Nobody would buy a long-term bond in reais because they remembered what happened the last time they bought these bonds and they got taken to the cleaners. Everybody borrowed in dollars. It wasn't until 2005 or 2006 the Brazilian government finally was able to issue 10-year bonds in Riyadh. It took almost 15 years for the pain to fade, for people to be able. So it took 15 years to come back from debasement. In contrast, in 2015, I was in Buenos Aires. And in any just world, nobody should ever lend to Argentina ever again. I mean, this country has defaulted three times just in this century. Forget about previous centuries and prior centuries. It's like having a crazy uncle in your attic. I mean, that's what I, you know, as in Uruguay, people say, what should we do about Argentina? I say, feed the uncle, send him back to the attic, hope he doesn't come back down. 
But in 2015, Argentina was back from the dead. It was back to being a place where portfolio has gathered from around the world. They were going to invest in Argentina again. You know the lesson countries have got out of this. You can default and come back. But if you debase your currency, it's a lot longer stretch to get back. So the, this is a long-winded way of saying, it, just because you have a government bond rate in the local currency doesn't make it risk-free. Because as long as markets know you can default, guess what? They're going to build in a spread. So I have a job to do with the Indian rupee risk rate. The 10-year Indian rupee risk rate, Indian rupee, I use the word risk rate, government bond rate was 6.56%. But I'm worried that some of that 6.56% reflects default risk. And here I'm going to try your strategy because I don't have the equivalent of a German bond in rupees where I can say, oh, I found something default free. So I want to assess how much of that 6.56% is due to default risk. I'll take you through ways in which you can do this, but I'll start with how I did it for India. I looked up the rating for India, which in January 2020 was you know, BAA2. This is a Moody's rating. Now I know I'm trusting ratings agencies here, and that's a dangerous thing to do. But to the extent that I trust Moody's, what are they telling me? It's not AAA. There is risk here. There's a, and they're giving me their assessment of risk. And if I trust that rating, it turns out that the default spread that goes with that rating was 1.59% at the start of 2020. I, do, I have a lookup table on my, on my website, and I'll talk a little bit about how that table is constructed. You give me a sovereign rating for a country, I can tell you what the default spread should be roughly. So let's set up an algebra problem. The 10-year rupee government bond rate is 6.56%, but I'm worried that it includes default risk. I have an assessment of default risk for you. It's about 1.59%. You have to come up with the risk-free rate in rupees. I'll give you your choices, and you tell me which one makes the most sense. You can say, look, governments never default on local currency. This is all abstract you know, theory. I'll just stick with the 6.56%. Okay? How many would pick the 6.56%? Okay, 6.56%. I'll come back and put you on the spot in a little while, or maybe in a, right away. No. And nobody else 6.56? Next choice, you can take the 6.56% and add the 1.59%. This is what you tried to do, and I kind of tried to steer it. You see why you don't want to add? You're worried about it being there. Adding it is just going to mean I'm counting it twice. Which means the risk-free rate, if you view this as not default-free, would be 6.56 minus 1.59, 4.97%. Now, I'll tell you the problem with using the 6.56% as your risk free rate. It gets a lot worse in other currencies. You take the Nigerian Naira government bond, it's like 15%. The Zambia and something, I don't even know what the currency is, like 30%. You take that as your risk free rate. Remember, this is just the start of the game, right? Then you look up the beta for your Indian company, and then you come to the equity risk premium you're going to use for India. Guess what you do? You say India is a riskier country, I'm going to use a larger risk cream. I think people double count country risk all the time. Because by using the government bond rate as their starting point and then putting a larger equity risk premium because it's a risky country, that same risk is being coined. And that's why I want to take up. And I want to come to something closer to risk free. I know I haven't fully sold you on this, but let me at least give you a sense of how you would do this across currencies, because that 1.59% came out of right field. You say, where the heck was that? So I'm going to give you three ways in which you can look up or find a default spread for your country. The first is, if your country has dollar or euro denominated bonds, then I'm home free because I can tell you what the default spread for your country should be. And here's why. Brazil has 10-year dollar-denominated bonds that trade. So if I told you that that bond right now is trading with a yield to maturity of 4%, you know how, how you'd get from the 4 to the default spread for Brazil, right? What would you subtract from the 4%? You'd sub subtract out the UST bond rate. If you're Poland and you have euro-denominated bonds trading at 3%, I'd subtract out the German euro bond rate. I'm getting a default spread based on a government bond. The only problem with this approach is this works for about 25 countries which have traded 
dollar or euro denominated bonds. And until 2004, that was the only way I could get it, so I took what I could take. Starting at about 2003 or 2004, a market opened up where I could actually get a market-based estimate of a default spread. It's the sovereign CDS market. Sovereign CDS market is really an insurance market where you can have a government bond and you're worried about default, you can go buy insurance against default and they give you the price of insurance on an annual basis. So the sovereign CDS market, you're getting a market estimate and the nice thing about that is if you don't trust ratings agencies, you're saying, look, I want a market set number. I'm going to, so that's the second approach. That's available for about 70 countries. So you've gone from 20 countries to 70. This is good now, I'm getting, you know. But there are two, about 204 countries around the world. A lot of countries I haven't covered. So the third approach, I look for a sovereign rating. And Moody's and S&P together rate about 140 to 150 countries. I take the rating and I look up the default spread that goes with that rating. You say, how the heck are you going to look it up? Remember those 70 countries for which I could get sovereign CDS spreads? I have ratings for those countries. I can start to look to see what a typical triple B rated, a triple double. So basically, I take the data that's there and create a lookup table. And so based on your rating, I can look up the spread that goes for you. So ready? Let's try this. So here's our mission. We want to find the Brazilian Riai risk free rate as of January 1st, 2020. So let me start by giving you government bond rates for about 42 countries. You say, what about the other 160? The other 160 have no government bonds. You're saying, but does that mean they don't borrow money? No, they borrow money like it's going out of style, but they borrow from the World Bank, the IMF, so there's no traded bond. So about 40 something countries which have government bonds. So these are government bond rates, not risk-free rates. And I've put, listed them alphabetically from the Australian dollar to the Zambian kwacha. If nothing else is stable, tells me what currencies are on the world, so I kind of look through the tables. So I'm not using the wrong currency name in the wrong country. But these are government bond rates. I want to get risk-free rates. So focusing on the Brazilian 10-year government bond rate, the Brazilian 10-year government bond rate was 6.77%. So what's my job? To come up with the default spread to subtract out. Here's approach one. Brazil has 10-year dollar-denominated bonds. In fact, it's one of seven countries I've listed here, which either have dollar or euro bonds. Bulgaria has a euro bond. The other seven have dollar bonds. To get the, risk, the default spread, I subtract from the dollar bond rate that I observe for that market, the T bond rate. So if I use that approach for Brazil, 3.63% minus 1.92% gives me a default spread based on the government bond of 1.71%. Don't try this if you have bonds in different currencies. I can't take a REI bond and subtract it because that'll give you complete nonsense. That's like Fahrenheit and Celsius again. So as long as I have dollar, euro bonds, I can do this. Okay. Any questions? Yes? After you've done all this, it's not, is it actually possible to earn this return on a risk-free basis in this currency using some actual financial instrument? And if not, no, we're talking about dollars, because dollars, we're not, you're saying after I get a, like an adjusted risk rate, in fact, I can earn more. I'm just operating under the illusion, because if I buy an Indian government bond, I'm earning well above that, right? Okay. I'm earning, but it's not risk free. So if you ask me, am I going to end up with an actual return that is less? As long as the country doesn't default, I'm actually going to earn well above the risk free rate, because the country doesn't default, I get the best possible outcome. The coupons get paid. So most of the time, you will actually earn more than this rate. What I'm trying to bring in is that, that, ca that catastrophic outcome. So most of the time, you look at actual returns on these bonds, they will actually be higher than what I call risk-free. But that can be said about corporate bonds as well, right? If you look at B, triple B rated bonds, the actual returns are higher because I've not factored in the default yet into that process. You could, with the sovereign CDS, you could, you know, it's tougher because you don't have rupee CDS. You've got a dollar CDS, so that's a messy part. All these spreads are dollar spreads, and my number is a local currency. There's a little bit of a currency mismatch, and I'll talk about why, you know, if that troubles you, what to do. But that's a, that's a worry that you have to factor in. It's beyond insurance. It's mismatching of currencies. Can I take a spread from a dollar market and apply it in a local currency? Okay. But every, yeah. Yeah. But you're thinking basically of predicting what the marginal investor will be doing because if they are wrong, the valuation is correct and it will correct at that point. 
remember there's value and price. What's our job in value? Is to say, let's take what's intrinsic, value the company. What drives price? Price is driven by what marginal investors do. Maybe they do stupid things and they build that into the price. In fact, I'll build on this theme because when you take to, I'll talk about risk premiums and how risk premiums are computed, you can be right about value and the price may never come down to your value because the marginal investors say, you know, that's why I use the word faith. It's in value, you're saying, I'm going to do the right thing even if the rest of the world is not and hope that it catches up. You know what? I am taking advantage of that marginal investor because that marginal investor might be more restricted in where they, the average Indian investor doesn't have a chance to invest in T bonds or because they're kind of their restrictions and so in a sense as a global investor when I value companies I might actually attach a different value than local investors can but they never have to come around to my point of view you know, from a true intrinsic value standpoint it's all about the riskiness of the cash flows and what so I'm going to say, I earn enough of a return, I'm okay with it, even if they never, and this is why the price value discussion becomes so critical. If you measure success by, did the price adjust to value? You want to get the marginal investors doing what you're doing. And that might not happen now in five years, 10 years. And that's something that is a price you pay for value investing, is you could be right and not make money or even lose money while being right. Second step in the process, I go to the sovereign CDS market. Sovereign CDS market, these are all, this is a complete list of sovereign CDS. So if you go to Bloomberg and type in SOVR, you'd see this entire list show up. There are about 73 countries for which I can get a 10 year sovereign CDS. So what you see in the first column are the sovereign CDS spreads for these countries. But there's a problem with the sovereign CDS market. That in, a, in a perfect world, I could just take the spread and say, that's my default spread. But the sovereign CDS market is a little bit of a problem. It's got counterparty risk. So remember, the insurance you buy is only as good as the person who sells you the insurance being around to pay off, right? And in the sovereign CDS market, there is that so It's not big, but there is that risk, which means all of these spreads have, 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 an, have, an, have a, that friction built in. And I want to find a way to take that friction out. I'm going to use a very, very, very sloppy way of doing it. Notice there isn't a single country with a zero sovereign CDS spread. So if you believe this market, what is it telling you? Nothing in the world is default free, right? And maybe that's true. Or maybe what's happening here is even the countries that are default free, like Switzerland, maybe the US, the market frictions are going to keep the number above zero simply because it's not a frictionless market. So you know where I'm going to go next? I took the spread for the US. 0.18%. And I said, that's really not a default spread for the US. It's a friction of the entire market. And I subtracted that 0.18% from every single CDS spread. So take Brazil. Brazil's spread is 1.74%. I could just use that as my measure of, de of default spread. But I've subtracted out the 0.18%. My adjusted sovereign CDS spread is about 1.56%. So right now, you have two estimates of Brazil's default spread, right? 1.7% from, from the government bond, 1.56% from the sovereign CDS. There's a third way I could get a default spread for Brazil. Brazil is a BAA2 rated country. It used to be, or it's a B single A2. I don't want to push up the rating. I don't have the power to do it. They used to be BAA2 rated before the troubles. This is like Ireland. I'll just call it the troubles. If you're from Brazil, you know exactly what the troubles were, and you lived through them, perhaps. BA2 rated country. And this is my lookup table. And a BA2 rated country has a, typically a default spread of 2.51%. 1.71% for the government bond, 1.56% from the sovereign CDS market, 2.51%. Brazil, as you have a luxury of riches, right? You can do all three. With India, you can do two out of the three, because India does not have dollar-denominated bonds. For Ecuador, I can do only one of the three. There's only a rating, or maybe, you know, I might not even, so basically for some countries, you're stuck. And that actually might make you happy, you're saying, I don't have to pick. Because let's face it, which number you pick will have determine what risk-free rate you end up with. Remember the 6.77% was my government bond rate? 
if I use the 1.71%, there are a few typos because one of the problems is updating numbers constantly, some of the numbers. So I'll send you the, uh, I've updated the, the packet online. But if you see a number that's different on the slide, the slide has the right number. I think in the slide it says instead of 1.71, it's carried over from the last year. So 1.71% is the default spread. So you subtract that from the 6.77%, my risk-free rate in REIs is 5.06%. If I trust the sovereign CDS market adjusted for the US default spread, I'm subtracting only 1.56%, so I end up with a higher risk rate. And if I subtract out the 2.51% that came from the rating, I end up with the lowest risk free rate of all. Let's say you're a biased analyst. You know what I mean by bias, right? Basically, you want this company to be undervalued in REIs. Which one of the three numbers looks most attractive to you? You want the lowest risk free rate, you're saying, I'm going to go with the 4.26%. Be careful what you wish for because I will give it to you. Because if you decide to go with that, it's true your risk free rate is lower, but this default spread is going to come back again later in the calculation. And it's going to come back pushing in the opposite direction. So if you pick a big default spread, your risk free rate will be lower, but your risk premiums are going to be higher. You know what I'm trying to say in an indirect way? Don't sit here trying to decide which is the right default spread. Just pick one and stay consistent. You're going to be okay. What will get you into trouble is if you keep moving between the different approaches depending on where you are in the calculation. Make your choice up front and that will drive the rest of your analysis. Yes. In fact, you know, all three, these are dollar spreads, right? And I'm subtracting it from a nominal REI rate, and you're saying, is that allowed? Technically, it's not kosher to do this. But you can get away with it if your risk-free rates are pretty close to the US. The level of the rate drives it. With Brazil, you're at the upper end of the range. It's a high, but if your risk-free rate were 15 or 20% in the local currency, you see the problem with attaching a dollar spread to a much higher risk rate? You're probably going to understate. Now, so basically, you have, to, I'll give you a way of dealing with double digit. When you get to double digit risk rate rates, everything gets messier. So I'll talk about a way of dealing with analysis if you're doing things in a currency where the risk free rate itself is 12, 14, 15, 80, or the Zambian quarter where the government bond rate is 30%. Then you're probably pushing the limits of the envelope. But unfortunately, all default spreads, the sovereign CDS market, you're going to get them either in dollars or perhaps in euros. You're not going to get them in the local currency. Okay? So there has to be a different approach where you take the dollar numbers and work with them. And I will give you that approach. Right? Let's talk about real risk free rates. For, yeah, go ahead. You could. Just lose the average all the way through that. Use a weighted average. Use, you can do whatever you want as long as that's a number that comes back later when I do equity risk premiums. And you know what? Your numbers are going to look a lot like mine when we're all done if you stayed consistent. So that's why I said pick one and stay consistent because that's going to come back again in the analysis. Yep. Why can the dollar percentage not be converted to the local currency? If you're going to do the conversion, I'll give you a way of converting. It's best to do everything in dollar terms than and do the conversion once at the end, rather than try to convert each number. Okay? And I'll give you a very simple conversion mechanism. But why do it with each number if you're going to do it across the board? Okay? So now let's talk about a real risk rate. You know what real analysis looks like? Most people in developed markets don't do real, in things in real terms. And there's a reason. Your taxes are based on nominal numbers. You don't want to do things in real terms because it's artificial. So if I'm doing a company in US dollars, I would never do things in real. You think, what does it even mean to do things in real terms? When you're doing a capital budgeting, here's how you do the cash flows. You take today's price and you hold price at constant dollars. So you say, if I charge $3, I'm not going to count inflation effect. I'm going to leave it at $3. You count the number of units you produce, and everything is done as if there's no inflation. You have real cash flows. Why would you do that? 
Well, if your inflation rate is 5,353%, do you really want to bring in an inflation rate in your calculation? So guess what? In high inflation currencies, people either go to a different currency or they say, look, I'm going to do things in real terms. Assuming I mean what I say about doing things in real terms, I'm not counting inflation in my cash flows, I need a risk-free rate that is also real, right? And I gave you the tips rate and said the tips rate is a real risk-free rate. And it's a good estimate of a real risk-free rate. Right now it's about 0.6%. However, I never have to do a real analysis in the US. I'm trying to do a real analysis in Bolivia or Ecuador or, you know, or Venezuela. There are no tips rates I can look up in Bolivia that I can use. Wouldn't it be nice if I could take the tips rate, 0.6%, and go around the world and say, that's a real risk free rate. I'm going to use it as a real risk free rate everywhere in the world. The answer is absolutely. But to do that, I have to make an assumption. And you can see why this assumption will get me into trouble. In a world where capital can flow freely across markets, Guess what's going to happen to the real risk free rate across markets? It's going to converge on one number because you can't have real risk free rates be different if capital keeps moving around because it's going to go to market. So if I make the assumption that capital flows are free and across markets, you know what? I can end up using the 0.6% as my risk free rate in Bolivia, in Venezuela, in Poland, wherever I go, because it is not a US dollar. There's no such thing. There's no currency before. It is a real risk free rate. But that works only if capital flows. If there are capital market restrictions and frictions, what can happen is real risk free rates can vary across the world. So you can have markets that are small and capital constrained where real risk free rates can rise to 6, 7, 8%. And there, if you want to do things in real terms, you almost have to, you know, you have to back it out based on what you can earn in that market. It's not going to be easy to do. And my suggestion if you're a market like that is do everything in a different currency. You basically, there's no way you're going to be able to deal with things in real terms if you can't even start with the real risk free rate. Now for the currencies where I computed the risk free rate, like the, I had started with the government bond rate, right? And when you have no default free entity and you have a government bond, you can do what I did with the, with the REI with, uh, with, with any of those currencies, with the Argentine peso, the Venezuelan, so Venezuelan let me take off, but any, uh, any country with a 10 year government bond in the local currency. That's the first choice. You can try to get a local risk free rate. The second choice is to do everything in real terms, but then you need a real risk free rate. The third choice, especially after you looked at the first two, is going to look awfully inviting, which is let's do everything in a different currency. Latin American companies talk, talk about dollarizing their numbers. I don't even know, think they know what they mean when they say dollarize, but basically they're saying, I don't want to deal with inflation in the local currency. I'll do everything in dollar terms. That seems like a pretty good outcome, right? Because we know what a dollar risk free rate is. We're not debating the risk free rate. But there is a cost you're going to pay if you decide to do everything in dollar terms, which is your cash flows have to be in dollars. And if you're a Brazilian company with your cash flows in reais, to convert reais cash flows to dollars, what do you need? Future exchange rates, right? It's not just now, but New York. Have, I mean, I describe high inflation as the equivalent of having an elephant in your living room. When it moves, you will notice. You can say, I put a big sheet over it. Hey, it's huge. It moves. The sheet moves with it. And that's exactly what inflation does. When it moves, it's going to create pain. Whether you do it through the risk-free rate or through exchange rates, there's no way you avoid it. So if you're trying to pick a different currency because you think you're going to avoid the problem, think again, because you're going to have to deal with the problem elsewhere. It is what it is. There's not the, remember we talked about macro uncertainty, economic uncertainty. This is the perfect example of macro economic uncertainty. You and I can drive ourselves sick trying to think about inflation, but it's going to get us nowhere. Right. So now I'm going to show you a graph. And you saw the equivalent in corporate finance. So I'm going to show you the updated version of the graph. So Remember with the Brazilian RIA, I computed a risk free rate, but I did this for every currency on that page I showed you. All 40 something currencies where there was a government bond, 
I ended up with risk free rates. You're saying, what is, how do I read this graph? The, the total height of the column is, is the total government bond rate. So if you take the Zambia and Quacha, the government bond rate is 32%. The red portion is the default spread. It's huge for Zambia because it's a very lowly rated country. If you take that out, you come up with the risk, the risk free rate. So the blue portion is my risk free rate. So I'm going to ask you a question. You know, you remember the answer you gave me in corporate finance, but let's see if you remember it still, because if you can give me the right answer, you've cracked what I call the currency code. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? I didn't ask you why government bond rates vary, because then you can sort of talk about risk and... Uh, let's have cleaned up for risk. These are truly risk-free. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? It's inflation. Everything else is a side story. So fill in the rest. If you have high inflation currencies, you're going to have high, high risk free rates. If you have low inflation currencies, you're going to have low risk free rates. And if you have deflationary currencies, what could you have? You could have negative risk free rates. You answered a question I keep getting asked over and over. Can risk free rates be negative? How can you even ask this question when you see them as negative in front of you? You should be asking, how do they get negative? And the answer is, if you expect deflation in a currency and real growth has collapsed, your risk free rates can be negative. It's unusual, but it's not unnatural. And therein lies the answer of why currencies won't affect your value. If you pick a high inflation currency, and you decide to do your valuation of high inflation currency, give me the bad news first. The bad news is your discount rate is going to be much higher, right? You're building off a bigger base. The good news, though, is when you do your cash flows, that same inflation that hurt you in the discount rate now boosts your cash flows. You'll have high inflation in your cash flows, high inflation in your discount rate. They cancel out. You switch from that to a Swiss franc risk-free rate. Hey, the good news is your risk-free rate is going to be negative. Your discount rates are going to be really low. But when I do your cash flows, if you have a deflationary currency, even though you might be growing the number of units you sell, you're going to get a terrible growth rate, and your cash flows are going to reflect that same inflation. Later in this class, I'm going to take a company, I'm going to value it in a currency, and then I'm going to revalue it in a different currency just to show you it's not an abstraction. But to do this, you have to be consistent about inflation. Now do you see why currency gets people into trouble? They project the cash flows. They don't think explicitly about currency. They come up with the cash flows in one currency. They use a discount rate in an entirely different currency. You've set yourself up for a gigantic mistake, not a you know, second order effect, but this is going to completely ruin your valuation. So now I'm going to build on that theme. It's inflation that drives. Now. So when you think about coming up for a risk free rate. Remember, there are lots of currencies I haven't even listed on the previous page because they don't have a government bond. So if I came to you with the Egyptian pound and say, give me a risk free rate in Egyptian pound, you're going to go looking for a government bond, but there are none. No 10 year bonds in Egyptian pounds. I'll give you two ways you can come up with a risk free rate in a, diff in a different currency. The first is to start with a real risk free rate. Take the tips rate and add the inflation in the local currency to it. Say, I'm done. So it's a build-up approach. You can even replace the tips rate with what you think is a real risk-free rate in that country. So it's a build-up approach. Here's the approach that I find most useful. I know the T-bond rate. I think it's a pretty good estimate of the dollar risk-free rate. So let's say right now it's 2%. Let's suppose that in the Egyptian pound, my inflation rate is 15%. And in the U.S. dollar, the, uh, the, in the U.S., the inflation rate is 1.5%. Do you see where I'm going to go? At the 2% dollar risk free rate, the differential inflation in the pound is about 13.5%. You add the 13.5% to the 2%, you'll end up with roughly 15.5%. If you want to get fancy, you could do a compounding effect, which is what it truly is, and you come up with 15.57%. And I think that's worth doing, especially as the risk free rate starts to get higher. But what I've done is replace the dollar risk free rate now with an Egyptian pound risk free rate. This is how you convert dollars. So remember that spread in dollars that you were added, doing with the local currency? If that bothers you, here's what I suggest you do. Do your entire analysis in US dollars for the company. And at the end of the process, after you've got a US dollar cost of capital, 
you have an additional estimation issue. You have to estimate an inflation rate in the U.S., which is relatively simple to do because all you need to do is take the difference between the T-bond rate and the TIPS rate. So right now it's about 1.3 percent. And then compare that to inflation in the local currency. And that's going to be messier because you might have to look at the IMF forecasts or whatever those are. But you got a risk. You could convert any currency's discount rate into a different currency. So now let's kind of close the loop on risk-free rates. The T-bond rate on January 1st, 2020 was about 1.92%. That's low by historical standards. In fact, it's much lower than what you would think of as a normal risk-free rate. You're saying, what the heck is a normal risk-free rate? You tell me how old you are, and I'll tell you what normal is going to look like to you. If you tell me a normal T-bond rate is about 5 to 6 percent, you've been working too long. Have you thought about retiring? Because you probably start in the 80s, right? Because, I mean, in fact, there's, in behavioral finance, there is this literature that backs up the notion that what you think is normal is what you observe between the ages of 30 and 35. So if you're 70, you've been around way too long, and everything looks too long. If you say it's 4.5%, maybe you start in the 90s. If you think it's 3.5%, you probably start in the early part of the last decade. If you think it's 2%, you probably started last year. And this is all you've seen. My point first is when people talk about normal risk free rates, the first stop you've got to make is, how the hell do you know what normal is? They can point to averages, but there is this big push, and this has been going on for the last decade, and here's how it goes. The T-bond rate looks too low. I want to replace it with something that is more reasonable. So let me play along. Let's assume the average 10-year bond rate over the last 30 years has been about 5 to 6%. So I can take my T-bond rate today and say, that doesn't look like it can stand. I'm going to replace it with 5%. Should I do this? Because there's actually a whole group of appraisers who've been doing this for the last four, five, six years, normalizing risk rates. Right? Should I do it? I see you saying no. Why, why not? You're playing their game now. Because if you, well, the minute you say it's probably going to be there's a no, 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 mean reversion is going to kick in, the, central, the conspiracy theories about central banks are going to come to the surface. No, it's all going. You don't want to play that game. Let's, let's, let's play their game. Let's suppose you take the 5%. As the risk rate. Say, say, go along. Okay, let's use 5%. Holding all else constant, if I normalize the risk rate, what's that going to do to my cost of capital? It's going to push it up. I have a higher discount rate. It's going to push down my value. Probably well below the stock price is now. And then I'm going to say, don't buy this stock. Put your money in the risk-free rate instead. The risk-free rate in valuation is not an abstraction. It's an opportunity cost. Do you see the problem here? You told me to reject investing in a stock. And now you told me to invest in the risk-free rate, but you claim the risk-free rate makes 5%. In what universe am I going to find a 5% risk-free rate in US dollars? You can normalize margins. You can normalize growth. You can't normalize risk-free rates. It is what it is. You think, but all my valuation shoot through the roof, only if you're being internally inconsistent. And when we get to that point, we'll talk about how low risk-free rates are more a bane than a moon. In fact, I'm going to value Heineken with a negative euro bond risk free rate. And I'm going to find it massively overvalued. So this notion that if I lower risk free rates, values are good, it's built on the presumption that everything else stays the same and you just lower the risk free rate. So my long-winded way, what I'm trying to say is don't mess with the risk free rate. Don't have an existential crisis because your currency has a really low rate or a negative rate. Just take it. It is what it is. Move on. There's so much more of evaluation left. Just factor that into the rest of your estimates. And in fact, when you look at risk-free rates in the U.S., it is true. Let's start with the fact. T-bond rates over the last decade are the lowest they've been in, 80, in eight decades. I think the 1940s maybe there were. But T-bond rates haven't been this low for a really, really long time. So it's true. And of course, the story that's given to explain why rates are low by many people is the Fed. The Fed did it. The Fed kept rates low. And if you watch CNBC long enough, this becomes almost conventional wisdom because for the last two days, you've been watching Lawrence Powell. Uh, is his first name Lawrence? Jerome Powell, right? 
Jerome Powell. I've been watching Jerome Powell. And my point is, why are we wasting our time watching this guy? Because the perception is he's going to tell us something about what interest rates will do this year. I've been watching Fed chairman now for 10 years. They have absolutely no idea what the interest rates are going to do because I can listen to them talk, but what happens in the market seems to be entirely different. But this notion that central banks control interest rates is deeply held, but it's absolute illusion for a simple reason. What's the only rate the Fed even indirectly controls? There's no Teeble rate. No, no. I give this you know, as a half joke. I talk about this three years ago. I, you know, I took my, my wife and two of my children to the Federal Reserve. They do a tour. Of the, so you go downtown. This, is, you know, this building, very impressive looking building. And you walk around the building. And they show you where the mint is and where the cash is kept and all that neat stuff. It's actually a good tour. I almost made myself persona non grata right when we walked in. Because I was going to this 25-year-old, nice person, she was a guide. I almost asked her, can you take me to the interest rate room? You know the room I'm talking about? Because if you listen to CNBC, there must be a room where Powell goes in, or Bernanke went in, or Janet Yellen went in, and she has a T-bill rate thing that she can move around. There's a T-bond rate, I will move that around as well. There is no interest rate room in case you're interested. The only rate the Fed even remotely has an effect on is the Fed funds rate. That was going to be my second question. Can you take me to the Fed funds window? I'd like to borrow a few million dollars. You can try it, but nobody's lending through that window to you. It's a bank overnight rate. That's the only rate they directly control. Can they affect other rates? Yes. Why? Because people perceive their, I mean, I, I described, it was when Ben Bernanke was the Fed chair, I described him as the Wizard of Oz. If you remember in the movie, the Wizard of Oz has no powers, but his powers come from the perception that he has powers. So people say, well, then how do you explain the fact that rates have been low? Well, it's very easy. If you think about rates as being a function of inflation and real growth, this graph, here's all I've done. I've taken the, 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 the black line there, Sorry, the red line, that's my T-bond rate. And I've computed what I call an intrinsic risk-free rate. You're saying, that's pretty fancy. What do you do? I took the inflation rate each year, added the GDP growth. So if you have inflation of 1% and GDP growth of 3%, I added 1 plus 3. And I said, you have an intrinsic risk-free rate of 4%. Nothing fancy. So you see the, the brown line? That is my intrinsic rate for the last 50-something years. Why have rates been low for the last 10 years? It's because inflation has been low and growth has been anemic. Has the Fed affected rates? Absolutely, I'm a realist. At the margin, the Fed affects rates, but it's at the margin. If inflation was 7% in the last decade, I don't care how much quantitative easing you did. And how active you are as a central bank, there is no way rates would have been 2 to 3%. It is true at the end of 2019, the gap between the intrinsic risk free rate and the actual T-bond rate is larger than it's been in quite a while. And that's a little troubling if you're an investor. The intrinsic risk free rate based on 2019 numbers in the US, which is showing more real growth than the rest of the world, was about 4%. The T-bond rate was 1.92%. I'm not going to do anything crazy like go sell short on T-bonds right now. But it's in the back of my mind saying the fundamentals now suggest that rates should rise. And you see why I didn't sell short? What's, what have rates done since the start of the year? They've dropped even further, coronavirus. There, I've sold short, I go bankrupt, I blame the coronavirus, I'm still bankrupt. <laughs> but my point is we build these elaborate theories. We like, we want, in our story, we want the Fed to have power. You know why? Because it makes, our, makes us feel more comfortable that there is this powerful entity out there that will move rates if things go wrong. And when you lose that faith, you're in a scary place. Japan, that faith is gone. Why? Because starting in the early 90s, the, the, the Japanese yen bond rate dropped close to 0%. No, and people have no illusion. So when the Japanese central banker talks, he's never on TV. Because people say, who cares what he says? He has no idea. I mean, I, you know, central banks are kind of insane in, in many ways. The definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. 
And the only tool you have is, I'm going to lower rates, I'm going to lower rates, I'm going to lower rates. It's not working. And it's like being in a gear shift car. You go second, third, fourth. Car's not going fast enough. You go to fifth, sixth, seventh. There's no eighth gear, but the gear shift is out in your hands. And you're still trying to race? Central banks around the world, I look at them and I say, maybe you guys need a different script. But the notion that rates are low because banks are willing them to be, kind of let that go. They influence rates, but they can't drive rates. Which brings me back to negative interest rates. When you see negative interest rates as an investor, to me it's never good news. Because when you see negative interest rates, what's the implicit message if you think about the intrinsic explanation? It's deflation and really low growth. There are two parts of the world where you see negative interest rates now. One is in the EU and the second is in Japan. And there's actually, unfortunately, a reason for those rates that's not going to go away, which is these parts of the world are aging. Now, I don't know what percentage of the Japanese population is above the age of 65, but it's an outlandishly high percentage, which if you have an aging population, it's really difficult to get economic growth off the ground. So you could have a blip, a good year, but you're going to revert back to a really bad, a really low growth rate. So here's how it plays out. If you have negative risk-free rates, the good news is your discount rates are going to be lower. But if you're operating in those parts of the world, you know what's going to have to be true about your growth rates as well, right? You can't be putting 15% growth rates and 3% growth rate forever. You're telling me two different stories than in your, in your valuation. So when I valued Heineken and I get them to steady state, I give them a minus 0.5% growth rate forever. And I remember there was somebody from Heineken in the audience said, that's so unfair. And I said, you weren't complaining when I gave you a minus 0.5% risk-free rate and you had a 5% cost of capital. You can't take the good stuff and ignore the bad stuff. Negative risk-free rates have to be reflected in all of your valuation. So that's a risk-free rate part of the discussion. Let's at least get started in equity risk premiums. As I said, the conventional practice for estimating equity risk premiums is to look backwards. It's a historical risk premium. And the problem with the historical risk premium is depending on the slice of history you take, depending on whether you look at T-bills or T-bonds, and even depending on how you even compute the average, simple or, or geometric mean, you actually end up with different numbers. Look at how, so see these 12 numbers on the top? No, so basically 8.186, these are all historical risk premiums. I'll talk about what the numbers below them are but there are 12 different numbers that are technically all historical risk premiums, and they range from 3.5% to 13.5%. So you say, I use a historical risk premium. You've given yourself license on this huge range, but they're all crappy numbers, and here's why. Statistically, when, in statistics, when you compute an average, you're trained to put in brackets below with the standard error, right? The standard error, if I go all the way back to 1928, which is 92 years of history, is 2.2%. Think about that statistically. If I told you the risk premium going back 92 years is 4.8%, it sounds impressive unless I say, but by the way, the standard error in that number is 2.2%. And that's with 92 years of history. If I go back only 10 years, look at the standard error, it's all noise. I've seen analysts value companies and countries where they use a 10-year historical risk premium. And when you use a 10-year historical risk premium, you're almost using noise. The standard error is going to dominate you. So first strike against historical risk premiums is they're noisy. The noise is not going to go away just because you wish it's, you know, the standard error is going to stay large. And even if you have 100 years of data, that standard error is still there. And the second is when you use the US data you have a secondary problem. The US data that we're using now reflects primarily the 20th century, right? 1928 through 2000 is what's driving the premium. And in the 20th century, the US was one of the most successful equity markets in the world. In fact, not even one. It was the most successful equity market in the world in terms of value created. If I take the most successful equity market in the world, if I back out a risk premium from the market and decide to use it as my risk premium going forward, do you see what I've done? Not only have I said that the market I've picked is going to be the most successful market of the 21st century, I've built that into my valuation. So you need a lot of historical data and you have the survivorship bias. Do you think, why not look at across a lot of countries? 
For a long time, people didn't even try that, but now actually there's a Credit Suisse risk premium book where they look across, I think, 25 countries, and they look at historical premiums, and you see the historical premiums in these countries, but the standard errors still remain. Even if you took a global average, it's lower than what I get by just looking at the US, the standard errors are still immense. I don't use historical risk premiums because they're noisy, they're backward looking, and there is no way out of this box. You can say, I'll wait another 200 years, I'll get more data. No, good luck on that longevity and lasting, outlasting the data. But the market's changing under you. So we'll come back and talk about what I use instead, but that's my first stop, historical premiums. So let's leave that behind. And here's the, the challenge you face. If I want to get a risk premium for a Brazil or a Vietnam or a China, there's, there's not even a choice in looking at historical premiums. There isn't enough historical data. But I need a risk premium for those countries. So I'll take you through three ways in which you can estimate a risk premium for another country. But they all are built on the premise that you got the US premium at least reasonably nailed down. So let's assume for the moment I've got the US premium nailed down. And I'm going to make it 5.2%. In a little while, I'll explain why that's my base premium for the US. So let's say I know my US premium. And I want to compute a risk premium for Brazil, an equity risk premium. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look for a country risk measure of Brazil. That's in percentage terms because it makes my life easier. And guess what I latch on to? The same default spread I subtracted out of the government bond rate to get to a risk free rate becomes my proxy for the additional risk. This is the state of the art, if you can call it this, on how investment banks and analysts compute risk premiums for other countries. They take a base premium for the US and they add the default spread for that country to it. And this is why I said if you pick a higher default spread and lower your risk free rate, it's going to come back to haunt you here. So the first approach, you just take a US premium, 5.2% in my case, and add the 2.51%, which was my spread based upon the rating, 7.71%. So that's the first approach. It's the approach that I saw when I first started looking at country risk about 30 years ago. And it troubled me, and here's why. One, in this case, 2.51% is the spread I charge for buying a Brazilian government bond, right? But I'm not interested in buying Brazilian government bonds, I'm buying Brazilian equities. And intuitively, I'd expect equities to be riskier than bonds because I'm the last guy in line. So my reasoning was, I should be demanding a higher premium. So I'll give you two other ways in which you can get the equity risk premium for Brazil. And I'm gonna, not gonna push one over the other. I'll show you what I use, but if you prefer the other one, I'll give you the pluses and minuses. The second approach is what Goldman developed as an, an approach to estimating equity risk premiums for countries. Here's what it did. It took the risk premium for the US. Let's say they agree with me and use 5.2%. And they look up two numbers the standard deviation in the S&P 500, which is easy to get, and the standard deviation in the Brazilian equity index, the Bovespa. So I have two standard deviations. In this case, let's say the standard deviation in the S&P 500 is 18% and the Bovespa is 30%. They set up an algebra problem. If I invest in the US with a standard deviation of 18%, I'm settling for 5.2%, but you're asking me to invest in Brazil where the standard deviation is 30%, they took the 5.2% and scaled it up for the fact that Brazilian equities are more volatile than bonds. You're using standard deviation as your standard. And essentially, you're coming up with a risk premium for Brazil of 8.67%. And if I subtract out the 5.2% from that, the country risk premium I'm charging for Brazil is 3.47%. Sounds pretty promising, right? You can look up standard deviations on a Bloomberg. You pick any index, you type in you know, HVT, you'll get a historical volatility in that index. <clears throat> Try it out for the Ivory Coast. You say, why do you pick the Ivory Coast? The standard deviation of the S&P 500 is still 18%. Or try it for Egypt. The standard deviation for Egyptian equities is about 5%. That's weird, right? Egypt is such a risky country. How, how are standard deviations computed? They're based on traded prices. I've kind of given you a clue. So what's going to happen in a market where liquidity is very light? You know, I remember reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, this was way back in time, I'm sure it's, more, it's much more upbeat now, about the Egyptian equity index. And it talked about how they recorded trades in an index. So there's a guy with a chalkboard, I'm not kidding, who stood in front of the index, and every time a trade happened, he would write the trade in the chalkboard. 
You think, that is so crazy. There are only five trades a day. Why do you need a computer system? You might as well just use a chalkboard. But if you're using a chalkboard to record trades, your standard deviation is going to converge on zero because if you never trade, your price doesn't change. If your price doesn't change, see, the downside of this approach is it's going to understate the equity risk premium for very illiquid markets. It does it for Costa Rica, it does it for, um, for Pakistan, it does it for, for Kenya, essentially any market where equity is very light. So if you're going the Goldman route, remember that that's one of the costs is you're going to end up understating premiums. In fact, the premiums will be lower than the US in those markets. Which brings me to my third approach, and this is the approach that I use to compute country risk premiums. I start with the default spread, like the first approach, but I don't stop there. I look up two standard deviations, just like Goldman does, but the two standard deviations I look up, one is the standard deviation for the Bovespa, just like Bo Goldman does, but then I look up the standard deviation for the Brazilian government bond. So in my algebra problem, here's what I set up. If you buy the Brazilian government bond with a standard deviation of 20%, the default spread it charges 2.51%, right? But if you buy Brazilian equities, which are one and a half times more risky, the standard the, the equity risk premium should therefore be larger, I get that 3.77%. You know why I use this approach? Because I make the assumption that liquidity is dry in one market, it's dry in, this, in the other markets in the same country. So if equity is very lightly traded, Kenya, the government bond is probably also very lightly traded. That might be more a hope than an expectation, but my equity risk premium then is my, so with all three I start with the US and I build up to the risk premium for the country. So I do this at the start of every year, and as those of you in my corporate finance class, you saw how I do it. So I'll, I'll summarize how the start of 2020 looked like to me. I need a risk premium for the US. I start with an implied equity risk premium. We'll talk about that in the next class. At the start of 2020, basically I compute based the S&P 500, and that number was 5.2%. That's my base. I go in and find the rating for every country I can. You're saying, why aren't you using sovereign CDS spreads? Because then I can do risk premiums for only about 70 countries. I can do ratings for 150. I look up the ratings for 150 countries. So pick whatever country you're interested in. I look up the rating for that country. I go to my lookup table and I look to see what default spread goes with that rating. So let's pick a number. Let's suppose that your country is like India. It's rated BAA2. The default spread for that would be 1.59%. The third step, I used to try to look up government bond standard deviations and equity standard deviations in each country, but I very quickly gave up because government bonds are not available in that many countries, and even the countries that are available, they're not traded very much. So here's what I, my cheat mechanism has become. I look up two standard deviations. One is a standard deviation in S&P Emerging Market Equity Index. So it's across a lot of emerging markets. And the second standard deviation is a standard deviation in S&P Emerging Market Government Bond Index. So basically, I'm looking at a collection in this index. They trade it. You can get it off the Federal Reserve site. The ratio of those two numbers at the start of 2020 was 1.18. Equities are about 1.18 times more risky than bonds. So let's see where we are. My base rate is 5.2%. You're a mature market. That's your premium. I've looked up a spread for you, 1.59%. I multiply the 1.59% by 1.18. I get the risk premium for your country. It's like 1.8 something percent, 1.88%. I add the 1.88% to 5.2%. I end up with 7.08%. When I'm done, I'm going to have an equity risk premium for about 150 countries. And here's what the world looked like to me at the start of 2020. So if you take Asia, you can see the spread in risk premium. You're saying, what's the red? The red is what I just computed, default spread times 1.18. The black is that number added on to 5.2%. First, notice that there are a lot of 5.2% here in the black. So US, Canada, Germany, Netherlands, Australia, all have 5.2%. So what do they share in common? They're all AAA rated. It's a very, very, very unsophisticated. Basically, I'm saying you're AAA rated, you're mature. I'm going to give you the US premium. And if you're not AAA rated, the red number is the additional premium added on. And in Asia, there's only one AAA rated country, which is not China, Singapore. And I give them a 5.2% premium. And the rest you see risk, and it risk varies. Depending on whether you're in Bangladesh or whether you're in China, the risk premium is going to be very different. And here's why I need this entire table. You're saying, well, how often am I going to value a Vietnamese company or a Bangladeshi company? Perhaps not that frequently if you're not a Bangladeshi or Vietnamese. 
But if your country, if your company gets revenues in that country, you've got to worry about risk premiums around the world. So next session when we start, I'm going to talk about how do we estimate equity risk premiums for companies. Because we now know how to do it for countries, but if I gave you Embraer, a Brazilian company, how would I estimate the equity risk premium for Embraer? And trust me, you can't just use the Brazilian equity risk premium for Embraer just because it's Brazilian. Having this table is what you need to come up with that company equity risk premium. I know you did a lot of so why not use the intrinsic risk premium? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the